This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1025, recorded on July 12, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. This is not something that anyone cares about, but ever since TWIV 1000, the clinical updates have gotten an even number. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because if you do two a week, one is going to be even and one is going to be odd. But this week, I stuck in an extra midweek episode with Koistia Chumakov. Really good interview. You have to listen. And uh, now, Daniel, you're going to be stuck mm -hmm. on odd numbers for a while. <laughs> So from here on out, all my updates will be odd. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. So let's have well, an odd update, Daniel. Okay. Well, odd that. Um, okay. <laughs> so I'll start with my quotation. Now, uh, unfortunately, um, people who are followers may have heard that Milan Kundera, the author of The Unbearable Lightness of Being, uh, passed this week. So um, I actually changed just uh, this morning to a different quotation, and, and let me uh, go ahead with it. For there is nothing heavier than compassion. Not even one's own pain weighs so heavy as the pain one feels with someone, for someone, a pain intensified by the imagination and prolonged by a hundred echoes. I'm a huge fan of Milan Kundera. So the, you know, those of you that haven't uh, had a chance to uh, read um, any, of the, any of the works, I, I highly recommend them. Just... Uh, I remember one time I was talking to, um, I think it was the, the head of the Nobel Prize Committee, and, and his, his advice was to read broadly, uh, not just stick in your little area, but try to sort of bring some breath to things. Um, and with that, I will talk about flu. So the, the CDC recently published a new risk assessment for the H5N1 avian flu viruses that continue to circulate in wild birds and poultry, um, also impacting some cats. People are following that. Um, for background, the influenza risk assessment tool, the IRAT, is an evaluation tool conceived by CDC, further developed with assistance from global animal and human health influenza experts. Um, and the IRATS used to assess the potential pandemic risk posed by influenza A viruses that are not currently circulating in people. Um, a risk assessment for the potential emergence and public health impacts was conducted in March 2022, um, and I'll leave a link in there, but uh, using A slash American Widgen forward slash South Carolina forward slash a whole bunch of letters, so I won't go into that. Um, but this updated assessment include new information available since that March 2022, um, including eight additional human cases. And uh, this updated assessment using the MINK virus from an outbreak in Spain in 2022, um, they say indicates that this virus has scored slightly higher in some risk elements compared with the previously assessed H5N1 clade 2.3.4.4B virus isolated from an American widgeon duck in 2022. Um, however, just to put this in context, uh, the mean high and mean low acceptable score ranges for these viruses overlap, indicating that these viruses remain similar. Their overall risk scores remain moderate. Um, so I, I'm going to go out on a limb here, Vincent, and suggest that the question about whether we should be worried about an H5N1 flu pandemic should not be posed as a binary. Um, you know, it's a it's national security and dare I say a global security issue that we uh, that we should be prepared for such a possibility. And the goal is not to stay up night worrying about this that sort of binary idea. Um, you know, what do you have nightmares about? But just to allocate appropriate resources do the correct science, continue to educate, be prepared so we do not have to come up with something, you know, at the last minute. Prepared? Did you say be prepared, Daniel? Prepare it. Yes. Yeah, I, I did say that. Yeah, I agree. We should have been prepared for COVID and now we could make vaccines. We do have antivirals for flu. Maybe we should make enough of them so that 
everyone could have them, right? And maybe even better ones without resistance issues and better yeah. efficacy. So let's fund some science, right? What's the story here? Let's get 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 yeah. with it. Our budget for science is not enough. If you you know, it's interesting. If you look at the military budget, maybe we need to think about it that way. Is this is a security issue? I mean, what what totally. are we really more at threat from? Um, and I think we're more 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 of a threat from uh, pathogens than um, these foreign countries. But just my little uh, two cents and worth about as you're mine. just the bleeding heart liberal. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> I'm actually talking about funding the military, but considering health to be part of the military. Okay. So malaria, two more cases of locally acquired malaria were reported in Sarasota County, bringing this up to a number of six locally acquired cases of malaria in Florida. What is going on down there? Um, all right. Moving into COVID. Um, and I'm going to jump right into testing. I, I, I like this article. Development of monoclonal antibody-based blocking ELISA for detecting SARS-CoV-2 exposure in animals, recently published in Virology. And our listeners are, are likely aware that besides humans, SARS-CoV-2 can infect several animal species. Um, so highly sensitive and specific diagnostic um, reagents um, might be worth developing. And here we hear about a panel of monoclonal antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid protein. I like that. This is a serological test looking for antibodies against nucleocapsid. And they use these monoclonal antibodies to develop a MAB-based monoclonal antibody-based blocking enzyme linked immunoabsorbent assay. So a little b ELISA um, test validation using a set of animal serum samples with known infection status obtained a diagnostic sensitivity of 97.8%, specificity of 98.9%. So I wonder if our friends, uh, Paul Kelly and others at the uh, Wildlife Conservation Society are listening. Um, but just remember, in addition to humans, SARS-CoV-2 can infect, we're going to go on with the list, Cats, dogs, deer, mink, lions, snow leopards, tigers, et cetera, et cetera. So you think uh, some of the zoo animals are infected? Are they checking in the zoos? Do you know, Daniel? Well, as we know, several um, several of the zoo animals got, got infected, got sick early on, right? Yeah. So, I wonder if they're just doing routine checking now, right? Um, you know, it would make sense for us to keep track of this um, because once you start to see this circulating, you know, in the zoos, people go there, Right. And so, you know, there can be back and forth. <laughs> Last time I was at the zoo was for TWIP. <laughs> yes, got to get you back there. <laughs> All right. Let's move right into, and we're moving fast this week, the COVID early viral upper respiratory don hypoxic phase, right? We've done that test. The person's positive. You've done the test. You're positive. It's not one of those expired tests that was sitting there for two years baking in the sun. Um, it actually works. Um, so the article... Repeated antibiotic exposure at risk of hospitalization and death following COVID-19 infection, the Open Safely trial, a matched case control study was published in eClinical Medicine. Now, this is an interesting one because we know that age and comorbidities are associated with worse outcomes with COVID. Um, you know, you'd say that I'm over the age of 50, uh, I've got heart disease, hypertension. Um, you know, we, we know that those are associated with uh, worse outcomes. So here the investigators are asking whether prior antibiotic exposure is associated with severe COVID-19 outcomes. You're going to tell them, I've been getting lots of antibiotics, I'm at high risk. Well, let's see. The investigators use this Open Safely platform, um, which integrated primary and secondary care COVID-19 test and death registration data. This matched case control data included um, 0 0.67 million patients aged 18 to, I like this, 110 years old. <laughs> so they had an older person in there from an eligible uh, 2.47 million patients with incident COVID-19 um, by matching with replacement. Um, we read that between February 1st, 2020 and December 31st, 2021, 98,420 patients were admitted to hospitals and 22,660 died. 55 unique antibiotics were prescribed, a dose-response relationship between numbers of antibiotic prescriptions and risk of severe COVID-19 outcome was observed. Patients in the highest quintile with history of prior antibiotic exposure had 
almost two times, so 1.80 times greater odds of hospitalization compared to patients without antibody exposure. Um, Similarly, the adjusted odds ratio for hospitalized patients with death outcomes was increased, 1.34. Large number of prior antibiotic type was also associated with severe COVID-19 related hospital admissions. Um, the adjusted odds ratio of quintile five exposure, so the most frequent um, with more than three antibiotic types was around two times larger than the quintile one with the lowest, about two times as likely. So lo lots of questions here about causation versus, dare I say, correlation. Um, you know, this is, as the authors say, consistent with a prior Spanish study. And uh, despite multiple ways of analyzing the data, it looked consistent um, and was even higher in certain age groups, such as those in the, you ready for this? The 40 to 59 age group odds ratio of 2.59. Mm. Um, lots of questions. This is related to disruption of the gut microbiome. Uh, could prior antibiotics impact what we refer to as the gut resistome, which comprises um, antibiotic resistant genes and gut flora, um, increasing potentially a COVID-19 patient's susceptibility to secondary bacterial infection, uh, difficulty to treat. Uh, but the obvious idea is that maybe people getting all these antibiotics are a bit different. Um, they tried to do a sensitivity analysis, adjusting for 17 individual diseases. Um, so, Daniel, did these patients get antimicrobials before at a different hospitalization, before they came in with COVID? Yeah, so that's it. You're looking over mm -hmm. like the period of time before they get COVID-19. And you're saying these people who get one antibiotic, people who've gotten multiple courses of antibiotics, yeah, well, as you said, you know, they may be just very sick people, right? That's that's my biggest concern. You know, even though they do all this matching, hard, hard to match without a prospective cohort. All right, let's do a placebo-controlled trial, okay? All right. <laughs> well, speaking of placebo-controlled trials, sort of, um, people might remember this article when it was a preprint. Uh, it's now published. The Coronavirus Disease 2019 Rebound Study, a prospective cohort study to evaluate viral and symptom rebound differences and participants treated with nermotrelvir plus ritonavir versus untreated controls, uh, published in CID. Um, so a bit of, bit of a reminder, um, the uptake of Paxlovid in patients with COVID-19 has been limited. Um, heard it again today, by concerns about the rebound phenomenon, despite the scarcity of evidence around its epidemiology. Um, the purpose of this study was to prospectively compare the epidemiology of rebound in Paxlovid-treated and untreated patients with acute COVID-19 infection. Um, I could have a bit more here to say about all those pundits who jumped on to be interviewed to promote this, uh, this idea of rebound, despite a scarcity of evidence, but I will just move on to the literature. So these are the results of a prospective observational study in which participants who tested positive for COVID-19 and were clinically eligible for Paxlovid were recruited to be evaluated for either viral or symptom clearance and rebound. Participants were assigned to the treatment or control group based on their decision to take Paxlovid. Following initial diagnosis, both groups were provided 12 rapid antigen tests and asked to test on a regular schedule for 16 days and answer symptom surveys. So viral rebound based on test results and COVID-19 symptom rebound based on patient reported symptoms were evaluated. Um, not a lot of numbers here with 127 in the Paxlovid treatment group, 43 in the control no treatment group. Um, and as we discuss this study at the preprint um, stage, this preliminary report suggested that rebound after clearance of test positivity or symptom resolution um, is higher than previously reported, but was observed at a similar rate, both between treatment and control groups. I think the pundits need to start reading, don't you, Daniel? You know, it's, it's really tough. And, you know, I mean, I have to say, like, people have died be, you know, you're just going to put this right out there. People died because of this integrity issue. You know, mm -hmm. science is powerful. Studies like this make it really clear that this is not a thing. You know, you give a high-risk individual Paxlovid, you can reduce their risk of ending up in the ER, the hospital, 
um, on a ventilator in the IC or dying, right? Um, you know, and when we're sitting with this 80 to 100,000 deaths a year, most of those are prevented. And a lot of reason these folks are not getting the right medicine is because folks were willing to get on there, sell their soul, not read the science. Um, yeah. How many letters have we had where patients bemoan their physician said, no, I'm not giving this to you. You'll get rebound, right? I, I had it today. It was a woman in her seventies, um, and yeah, her doc was was telling her, oh, "I'm just not comfortable." You know, I, I hear a, I hear a lot about this rebound. Now, what does that mean? I hear a lot about this rebound. Um, you know, what what scientific journals are you reading? Where no, you're no. seeing, yeah, that doc goes to the local diner for for coffee, and the guy behind the counter, hey doc, you hear all about this rebound? You said, "Oh, really?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I knew Jerry. Jerry got the Paxlovid, and Jerry had the rebound. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> it's not funny. We're not being joking about it, folks. It's just we're, we're bemoaning how to get physicians on board, right? Yeah. I mean, I I am I am optimistic, and I, and I hate to say this, and you know, we got to sort of you know clean our own house. Um, but you can't wait till the pharmaceutical company comes around with a bunch of glossies. Like we have to keep up to date. This is a disease with mortality. When our patients come to us, there, there's an expectation that we're going to put in the time and the effort to give them evidence-based recommendation, not not just yeah, not just based on a bunch of anecdotes. All right. So number one is we've been talking about for a while, um, Paxlovid, fully licensed um, and beneficial in vaccinated unvaccinated, under the age of 50, over the age of 50, really people who have risk factors. But again, this isn't for everybody. Um, and sometimes it's a little work looking at the kidney function and looking at the drug-drug interactions. Number two, remdesivir. We've been bemoaning issues with limited access, but that three-day early IV um, pine tree-based um, approach with about an 87% reduction in progression. Number three, molnupiravir. The only problem with molnupiravir is the less than impressive efficacy. Quite a problem. Number four, convalescent plasma. Really only recommended um, as a treatment option for immunosuppressed COVID-19 patients really early on. Um, no other options. Um, and as we keep saying, let's avoid doing harmful and useful things. All right. Now we move on. Um, the early inflammatory the person's progressed, maybe become hypoxic. That's when we think about steroids, anticoagulation, potentially ending up in the hospital with pulmonary support, remdesivir if early, immunomodulation, and again, avoiding unnecessary therapies. And moving into the bulk of today's session, the late phase PASC and long COVID. Um, and this, this is an area which actually I was glad that this article came out because I, I think a, there's a growing recognition of this as a problem. So the article exaggerated blood pressure elevation in response to orthostatic challenge, a post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection PASC after hospitalization was published in Autonomic Neuroscience. Maybe the first time we've uh, referenced a autonomic neuroscience article. But another study where they investigated the effect of COVID-19 after recovery on blood pressure during orthostatic challenge. 31 out of 45 patients hospitalized due to COVID-19-related pneumonia that developed PASC and did not have hypertension at discharge were studied. They underwent a head-up tilt test called a HUT, um, at about 10.8 plus or minus 1.9 months from discharge, all met the PASC clinical criteria, and an alternative diagnosis did not explain the symptoms. Um, the population was compared with 32 historical um, healthy controls. Exaggerated orthostatic blood pressure response was detected in 34.7% of the patients, uh, representing a significantly increased prevalence, almost 7.67-fold increase, p-value to 0 0.009, um, compared to only seeing this in 6.4% of the healthy controls matched by age who underwent testing. Um, so this prospective evaluation in patients with PASC revealed abnormal blood pressure rise during the orthostatic challenge, suggestive of autonomic dysfunction in about a third of the studied patients. Um, I'd like to point out it may be a challenge to access the tilt table testing and the HUT, the heads up tilt test. Um, so for a lot of folks, consider screening with the NASA lean test um, as we do have therapies that can help address individuals with the orthostatic challenges.
All right. Um, I also, in the section, like to cover what we recommend on hospital discharge, right? Patients um, survive the hospitalization. They're getting ready to be discharged. The article, long-term follow-up of a multi-center cohort of COVID-19 patients with pulmonary embolism, anticoagulation management and outcomes was published in Thrombosis Research. Um, Again, not a time to just read the headlines. So these are not just COVID-19 patients being discharged. They're COVID-19 patients with pulmonary emboli. So these are the results of a retrospective multi-center study in four Italian hospitals between March 1st, 2020 and May 31st, 2021 in patients who experienced a pulmonary embolism during hospitalization for COVID-19 pneumonia, excluding patients who died during hospitalization. Um, Baseline characteristics were collected and patients were grouped according to duration of anticoagulation treatment. So we're looking at folks that got three months or less, and we're going to look at folks that went on past greater than three months. And the primary outcome was incidence of um, VTE recurrence, venous thromboembolism recurrence, while secondary outcomes were were death, hemorrhages, um, or recurrence during the follow-up. 106 patients um, with pulmonary emboli were discharged. Of these, 89.6% had follow-up longer than three months. Uh, Seven folks were lost to follow-up. Four died in those first three months. Um, Just to give you a sense, 106, right? Four of those died the next three months, right? Not all that mortality is happening in the hospital. The median follow-up was 13 months overall. 23% of the patients were treated for the three months or less. 77% uh, received anticoagulation for greater than three months. Um, Of patients in the short treatment group, 4.5% died compared with 5.5% in the longer treatment group. Um, No difference um, was shown in the risk of VTE recurrence. Actually, 0% in the less than three months versus 4% in the more than three months. Uh, Major bleeding, 4.5% versus 4.1%. And when they looked at composite outcome, less than three months, 9.1%. More than three months, 11%. So no difference was found between the true treatment groups. So just to put this um, back together, in this retrospective multi-center cohort, prolongation of duration of anticoagulation, beyond three months um, did not seem to affect any of these outcomes. Three months might just be enough. Okay. Now, another issue is sort of a theme that we've hit on for a while, the risk of cardiovascular disease after COVID-19 diagnosis among adults with and without diabetes. So this isn't getting diabetes. This is having diabetes uh, published in Journal of the American Heart Association. So the authors comment that growing evidence suggests that incident cardiovascular disease may be a long-term outcome of COVID-19 infection and chronic diseases such as diabetes might influence the cardiovascular disease risk associated with COVID-19. So the researchers evaluated the post-acute risk of uh, disease, uh, cardiovascular disease greater than 30 days after diagnosis in 1,898,635 adults uh, age 20 or older with COVID-19 from March 1, 2020 through December 31, 2021. So think about the timing. We're pretty much looking at pre-vaccine. A comparison was made with a contemporaneous control group comprising 11 million 180,192 adults without recorded diagnosis for COVID-19. Um, here they evaluated the post-acute risk of cerebral vascular disease greater, cardiovascular disease greater than 30 days after a COVID-19 diagnosis by diabetes status. They found that patients with a COVID-19 diagnosis had a significantly greater risk of all cardiovascular outcomes compared with patients without a diagnosis of COVID-19. Hazard ratio 1.66 with diabetes a little higher, 1.75. Cardiovascular, so 1.66 with diabetes, 1.75 without diabetes. Um, Cardiovascular outcomes included cerebral vascular disorders, dysrhythmia, inflammatory, heart disease, ischemic heart disease, thrombotic disorders, other cardiac disorders. So let us pull this back together. So we're certainly seeing an increased risk of cardiovascular disease after COVID-19. Not clear to me that the diabetes is actually having a big impact here, 
despite being in the title. Um, and then again, as we talked about, think about the timeline here. We start looking in March 2020, and then we're going to follow through. Think about when the vaccines come out, and we're going to follow out to December 31, 2021. So Daniel, if you did this study with, say, influenza patients, would you get, would you find cardiovascular events also higher in the in the flu patients? So in the studies looking at that, the answer is clearly yes. Um, and when we looked at it, you know, United Health Group looked at patients, you know, try to figure out what's the benefit of flu vaccine. The biggest benefit, particularly in younger individuals, of getting your flu shot is prevention of cardiovascular outcomes prevention of cardiovascular related hospitalization. So certainly a connection here with um, viral diseases and cardiovascular outcomes. All right. And I will wrap it up here before questions. I see we have a few questions today, but uh, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, only a couple, two, three weeks here left in our Foundation International Medical Relief of Children fundraiser. I was just checking on my uh, my cows today, uh, my cattle today with uh, Alice <laughs> in Uganda, because um, I guess now I've got cattle. I've got a cow and a bull. Um, but May, June, and July, donations made to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and doubled. We're trying to get up to a donation of $20,000 from PWB to Foundation International Medical Relief of Children. Time for your questions for Daniel. You can send them to daniel at microbe.tv. Larissa writes, I'm a 55-year-old woman who got pericarditis with my first booster and similar symptoms after my second. I got the Moderna vaccine. My cardiologist told me I can't get any more boosters. It's been 18 months since my last shot. Do I have any protection against severe illness at this point, or am I essentially unvaccinated after all this time? Related question, since I can't be boosted, treatment is important. I take clonazepam. The Liverpool Drug Interactions website says not to administer Paxlovid with clonazepam. My doctor said maybe I could reduce my dose, but she wasn't sure. The pharmacist said I could not take it. No way to get remdesivir in my area. Suggestions. Okay, so this is a good this is a good challenge. Um, so you know, I understand, and we we've talked about this. You know, it is rare, but there certainly are individuals who have issues with the with the vaccines and the cardiac inflammation that you're describing. Um, you know, I, I'd be on board with your cardiologist saying, okay, maybe that's not the best way um, going forward, uh, particularly with the mRNA vaccines. Um, it would be nice for us to have a sense of maybe Novavax is that an alternative that that might be tolerated, but, but I understand. So that's a, the first question. Um, the second is, do you have protection? Um, and we've kind of gone through this. Okay. Ideally you want to get three shots. You want to get that broadened, or maybe even just need more of a gap between the first two. Um, but you, you certainly have protection with two maybe not what we would like with with 3 um, but you're not you're not walking around unshielding you're not walking around without um, some degree of protection um, the next is as you rightfully say you know potentially 80 90% reduction in progression if you can get early antiviral therapy so uh, shine a spotlight on the liverpool covid-19 drug interaction checker um, you know i Spent a little bit of time today. Um, you know, one individual it was really easy, not on any medications, good kidney function, boom, easy lift. Uh, second, we had a little bit of interactions of, okay, well, what about this? What about that? Uh, now, clonazepam is um, metabolized through the cytokrine P450, CYP3A. Everyone make sure you memorize that. Mm -hmm. um, if you take the Paxlovid, which has the ritonavir, that's going to really shut down the metabolism of clonazepam. That, that is not a safe thing to co-administer. But you know what you can do? You could ask your doctor about temporarily stopping the clonazepam and replacing it with lorazepam. So not all the benzodiazepines are uh, metabolized the same way. Um, so there are ways around this. And, you know, we went to medical school. We should be able to figure out those ways around it. And, and this clonazepam is not one of these that persists a long time, right? So it's a benzodiazepam. So what you're going to want to do is stop it. Make sure mm -hmm. it's you know it's not going to it's not going to start rising in level. So stop it the next day. Start your Paxlovid, um, but don't All take right. it while you're on you know within ten days because I would worry about it accumulating. And actually, you know, it's a benzodiazepam. It can be associated with respiratory depression. It can be um, it can be a dangerous thing. And actually, maybe talk to your doctor ahead of time about 
could you just switch from clonazepam to lorazepam? Maybe use a different benzo because there's there's COVID's out there, so it's nice to be set ahead of time. Okay, now I got an idea for another episode we need to do. <laughs> Multiple. We needed to do one on what if your doctor won't give you Paxlovid? And another one, what if you can't take Paxlovid? In you know, five minutes, you can tell them what to do. Then we'll get lots of views, right? Yeah. I think, you know, also, you know, you sort of individually you kind of have to spend the time with each person saying, let's go through your medication list. Yeah, of course. Why are you on which medication? Yeah. Charmaine writes, I just read that the national health system in the UK has stopped offering COVID vaccines to people who are not at high risk. This is nuts. They said it's to prioritize those most at risk and cut the backlogs and waiting lists. Good Lord, don't they have enough vaccines and or personnel to give people jabs? And is the demand still that high? Why would you tell people they can't have it? My sense is that we're swimming in the availability of vaccines. Charmaine. <laughs> okay. Well, it's very entertaining. I, you know, I'm a bit taken back by this. I, I can't imagine that right now in July in the UK, there's such a demand for these uh, vaccines <laughs> and such a limited supply. Um, you know, as we've talked a little bit about the current bivalent boosters, the whole idea that you're going to get three to four months of reduction in infection and, and also some, you know, reduction in your risk of severe disease. I just don't think there's a lot of compelling data there. I think what we've got is once you've got those three shots, uh, maybe there's a bivalent in there at some point, um, you're really in pretty good shape as far as what do vaccines do? They prevent disease. Um, maybe in the fall when there's new um, updated XBB-based um, vaccines, maybe when we see that they're actually producing neutralizing antibodies that are going to be effective against the circulating variants, um, they'll you know be more of an imperative. Um, but yeah, this this sounds a little disturbing. So I looked this up and here's a clarification. While the UK will stop providing vaccine to those under 50, anyone who has a clinical need, high risk, severe disease, healthcare workers, caregivers, they can still get a shot. Okay. So, you know, it still leaves people, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are not at risk who would like to get shots, right? And I think they should be able yeah, to get maybe it. maybe there's folks who just decided, you know, I was going to wait and now they waited. And uh, yeah, to, you really don't want to close the door if someone decides they want to get vaccinated. This is in line with the UK wanted to kill all the cats at the beginning because they were getting COVID, you know? I think Boris was going to kill the old people too until he realized he was old. Okay, that was political. <laughs> Sorry that I said that. <laughs> Paula writes, since you brought up shingles shingrix, it reminded me to send a question about my friend who has repeated bouts of shingles in the roof of her mouth every few months. Nothing seems to stop it. Her doc gets her on antivirals immediately if she calls to say it's erupting again. She also seems to have it happen after any dental work. It's been going on for years. She had the single shingles vaccine in between bouts of this, and it stopped for slightly longer, then came back. What causes this? What other options are there out there? Yeah, so um, you know, this virus is, is a problem um, in in. Well, let's just say immunocompromised individuals, you know, and we think of that broadly. Someone had a transplant, for instance, there are immunosuppressive medications. Maybe someone's on immunosuppressive medications for um, some sort of autoimmune rheumatological disorder. Um, it sounds like this might be a case of someone with a, a maybe even a particularly isolated immune issue uh, controlling the virus. Um, so we do actually routinely put people on chronic suppressive antivirals. Um, you know, standard would be maybe a Valtrex, which is a um, uh, antiviral that you might take 500 milligrams once a day, maybe 1,000 milligrams once a day. Um, so there are ways of uh, addressing this with chronic antivirals so the person doesn't have to have the problem and then jump in with the treatment. So it's actually shingles, Daniel, and not herpes? Uh, so this can be shingles. Yeah, you can get wow. the varicella zoster recurrent. I mean, that's also important to do. When you get a recurrence, swab it, do the viral PCR, make sure you know what you're treating. Imagine that. And then once you know what you're treating, then um, yeah, it would be the same same approach, but it's yeah. always good to know what you're treating. It's interesting because that's very frequent for shingles, isn't it? There are a few people that I've seen that have these wow. recurrent. Yeah, Interesting. All right. Our last one is from David. Consistent with Dr. Griffin's comments on, if you are not thinking about MPOX in the differential, you will not test for it nor diagnose it. I wanted to share an article 
incorporating MPOX into the differential of genital skin lesions due to infectious causes. The idea was to have a table with multiple variables listed together for the clinician to work through a genital skin lesion differential. I thought this could be helpful. Of course, STIs may occur concurrently. Thus, testing for co-infections is important to quickly identify all pathogens and appropriately treat individuals. And uh, David sends a link to this, uh, which is um, a product of uh, the U.S. Uh, military, Daniel, as you were mentioning at the top, health.mil. Okay, okay. And and David is a, a lieutenant colonel uh, in the Air Force Medical Readiness Agency. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, it was just, uh, we were talking a lot over this last weekend um, about the military first, I'm going to say, because uh, uh, one of my, well, my college roommate's son is thinking of becoming a Navy SEAL. And I don't know if you know this, Vincent, I tried to join the military several times. First, I was thinking of going to the Naval Academy. I wasn't sure I could stay on the varsity sailing team and they might make me, you know, <laughs> work too hard if I couldn't do that. Then I tried to join the Air Force and, uh, you know, tried to get them to agree that my first posting would be in, in uh, Korea. Apparently, uh, the needs of the government supersede the needs of the individual, so they wouldn't wouldn't sign. But we could have almost been colleagues. Wow. Uh, but no, I think I think this is great. I mean, um, we need to have a, a, a broader uh, view when we're looking at patients with um, sexually transmitted infections because we don't test for it. We don't think about it. We're not going to make the diagnosis. So, yeah, I applaud this. This is great. Hopefully, we'll leave a link in our show notes. That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe. 